flexed everything from head to toe, and the audience cheered. And Merv said, oh, impressive, but really, what, what do you do with all those muscles? He stretched again and did things with biceps and triceps that people had not seen before, and the audience cheered. And Merv said, okay, yeah, but what do you really do with all of those muscles? And the bodybuilder sat back down a little bit embarrassed and bewildered, and he had no answer for that, other than to stand up and flex the muscles. He didn't have any other answers for that. I have a similar question for you today. What do you use your muscles for? What do you do with your God-given talents and gifts? Now, last week, you should have received your stewardship packet. If you didn't, it's probably on the back table. So if you haven't got it, make sure you get that. And for those of you who are, are visiting with us today, Think of this within the terms of your own church, if you have a church family. If you don't, we'd love to have you join us. But if you receive, if you looked at that, you have a lot of different papers in there. Eric pointed some of them out last week during his sermon. And basically, all of these forms you receive ask you to answer the question of how you are going to flex your muscles for God. How you're going to use your muscles, your spiritual and physical and gifts of your time, your talent, your treasures to further God's kingdom. In our scripture reading today, we read where James and John, the sons of Zebedee, asked something of Jesus. Let's listen in. Verse 37. In your glorious kingdom, we want to sit in places of honor next to you, they said. One at your right and the other at your left. See, James and John approached Jesus that evening asking basically for the top two positions in heaven. That's really what they're asking for, because they, to them, position meant everything. Where you were in the scheme of things was important. And they were thinking if only they could be that important. If only they could be in a position of power like that. If only they could be especially talented, or then they could be useful to God. Now, I wonder how many of us here today have that same notion. If only we had more talent, or more power, or more influence, or more money, then we could make a difference for God. But that's not how God works, is it? God doesn't do things the way we think of he might ought to do them in his kingdom. Someone once compiled a list of people in the Bible who God used to really make a difference. And they're probably not who we would have chosen if they were the people we could be choosing. Listen to some of these. See if any of these ring a bell or maybe even you can relate to them. Moses stuttered. You know that? He didn't stutter. David's armor didn't fit. Hosea's wife was a prostitute. And then there was Jacob. He was a liar. And David had an affair. Solomon was too rich. Abraham was too old. And David was too young. Timothy had ulcers. Peter was afraid of death. Lazarus, well, he's dead. John was self-righteous. Jesus was too poor. Naomi was a widow. John Mark was rejected by Paul. Paul was a murderer. In fact, so was Moses. Jonah ran from God. Miriam was a gossip and a bigot. And Gideon and Thomas both did what? They doubted him. Jeremiah, he was depressed and suicidal. Elijah was burned out. Martha was a worry ward. And Samson had long hair. Noah got drunk. Did I mention that Moses also had a short fuse? And so did Peter and Paul and a whole lot of other folks. But when Jesus chose his disciples, he didn't choose the more influential people in his society, the cream of the crop. No, he chose the simple, everyday men, folks like you and me. See, God has a way of taking the most imperfect people and using them his perfect plan. And rarely is it a way we expect. Listen to what Jesus tells us where the disciples in verse 38. You don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup that I'm of sorrow that I'm about to drink? Or are you able to be baptized with the baptism of suffering I must be baptized with? And James and John have, oh yeah, yeah, we're ready, we get it, and we're gonna do that. Absolutely, we're ready, bring it on. drink from my cup, and be baptized with my baptism. But I have no right to say who will sit on the places, on the thrones next to mine. God has 
prepared those places for the ones he has chosen. It really wasn't too much later that James and John saw who got to be with Jesus, one on his left and one on his right. And they were the thieves that hung on the crosses on either side. See, Jesus isn't looking for people with worldly power or great worldly importance. He's looking for everyday folks, people just like you and me. He wants people that are going to be there for him. And so anybody know who uh, John Brody is? The name John Brody rings up. He was the quarterback for the San Francisco 49ers several years back. And a million dollar quarterback. Jimmy had another job on the team. Anybody know what it was? He held the ball for the kicker. The quarterback of the 49ers also held the ball any time the ball was kicked. And some reporter asked him one time, why in the world would you do that? Why do you have a million quarterback? Why are you breaking yourself down to that level? Why are you holding the ball? He said, well, if I didn't, it'd fall over. You <coughs> see, Brody got it. He understood that what was needed was to be there for the team. And if that was as quarterback, fine. And if that was holding the ball so it didn't fall over, it worked too. Because he was there for the team and helping the team to accomplish its goals. That's the type of person Jesus is looking for. So how are we going to hold the ball for Jesus? Well, in the next few verses of our scripture reading, Jesus describes what is known as servant leadership. I should hear his words again. He says, you know that in this world, kings are tyrants, and officials lord it over the people beneath them. But among you, it should be quite different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. Jesus is saying to us, we have to be a servant of others. That's what this sheet here is all about. This is your time and talent sheet. That's what it's all about. And as you look over this sheet, over this next week, and I hope you're prayerfully looking over this and considering where God is calling you to do, I want you to think about things a little differently. We tend to think of it as, what do I have to do for my church? What is it that I can do on here for my church? Really, that's not what this is about. What this is about is, what do I get to do for God? That's what this sheet is about. You're making promises to God of what you're going to do. Did you know that if you sign up here under building and property, the care of the church grounds, mow, wedge, and cleanup, you're actually signing up for evangelism and outreach? Sure you are. You may not think you are, but you are. See, people who drive by this building look at it and see that somebody cares enough to take care of it, to take care of God's things. It says your faith is dynamic enough that you care for even the simplest of things. And did you know that if you signed up for extended session, which is under here, under Christian education, that's actually working in the nursery, volunteering and helping in the nursery, it's more than possibly...